for our first episode in English, we received Alex Carty. Alex is a second year PhD student in philosophy at McGill University. He did his master degree thesis on the philosophical conceptions of love under the supervision of Gary Foster. In today's episode, we address the conceptions of love in the philosophy of emotions. We first describe and criticize the two polar conceptions, the objective and the subjective views. The objective view is the view that we love the properties of the object of love, while the subjective view is the view that love does not depend on properties of the object of love, but the properties of the subject. To avoid criticism for the subjective and objective views, Alex presents two alternative theories of love, the union view and the relationship view, and he defends the latter as the most plausible. Alex thinks this view is more attractive than the first two because it can explain both subjective and objective reasons for love. And now I bring you Alex Carty. Parlons éthique in English. Hi. So for this premiere, we will address the very important question: What is love? I'm, I'm not going to sing the song. <laughs> uh, and uh, and the perspective you take on this question uh, might be a bit surprising for people, as you you put aside anything science says on, on love and focus solely on the philosophical part of the question. And and most people talk about love through sciences, so it it might be a bit uh, different for them to experience what you're going to say. So maybe as an introduction to the topic, can you just explain the, the framing of uh, the work you, you're going to do? Sure. So as you mentioned, uh, I'm sort of approaching the question of like what love is or what the nature of love is. There's a number of ways you could put it, but um, we're really focusing on love as an emotion. That's the first sort of way in which I'm approaching the question. But the second one is It's a normative question as well, in the sense that when you love someone, um, you usually have reasons. Uh, at least some people think you have reasons mm -hmm. uh, to love them. And so, one of the the ways that I'm sort of approaching the question here, setting aside all the stuff for science and everything, is saying, well, in a case where you either do love someone or where things might go awry, <laughs> let's say we're, we'll encounter some problems like that today. Mm -hmm. The the question that we're asking is, well. What, where exactly do those, do those reasons come from in the first place? And in the second place, are there reasons to begin with? Because some people are, are, are a little bit skeptical and they say, well, there are no or, there are no reasons for love and love comes from the subject itself mm -hmm. uh, who's doing the loving. So that's just getting ahead of things a little bit. But um, that, that's the, the two ways in which I'm approaching the question and putting science, like any sort of empirical matter uh, aside and just saying, well, when love is actually, we're feeling this emotion, Uh, what sort of reasons in a normative sense do we do we have to feel the emotion? Um, and just one other thing for basic terminology, when you read a lot of the stuff, this kind of literature, uh, the terminology being used is usually the the lover, so the subject who's doing the loving, and the beloved, so the, the thing or, you know, I'll refer to the person or the properties that are being loved in some cases, but uh, the, you know, speaking crudely, it's just the object or the person to whom the subject is, is feeling love or the emotion. Um, so that's the kind of way in which the, uh, let's say, the taxonomy uh, is, is, is first uh, split up. And, so. uh, and just to give another example, because it, it, it might be easy for somebody that's in analytic philosophy to just understand what you just said. What does mm -hmm. it mean to have reasons to love? And, and one of the examples that I encountered in, in, uh, in my studies was uh, the case of grief. And one of the puzzles, and it, it's really hard to understand It, at the beginning, it sounds a bit alien when we, we talk in like without science and without empirical stuff about love. And I, I think it's easier with griefs. Uh, one of the questions is, should we feel grief forever? Uh, mm. Like mm. if you love the person and the person is dead, the reason of your grief is the death of the person. Therefore, if you love the person and you missed her, you should miss her forever. Because yeah, this reason right. that you lost the person never disappears and you say yeah but life goes on and you, we have like we, we cry and then we feel better and but all this is empirical stuff but that is not part of the question the, the, the question is normative in the sense should you still feel grief and even if everybody on earth after two years don't feel grief anymore maybe the right answer it would be to feel grief forever because the reason doesn't change so it's, it's this framing i think it's it's a bit 
hard to understand, but I think when we, we're going to speak about it, people will, will get it. But at the beginning, I think for, for me in one course, uh, one course on uh, the philosophy of emotion, it took me seven courses before understanding mm. this thing. And, yeah. and I, I know it might happen for people <laughs> listening to us. So there's something a bit alien, but like bear with us and yeah. we're, we're going to uh, go somewhere in the end. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I would mention uh, just looking ahead is um, one, one sort of problem for one of the, the types of views of love um, is if uh, there are no reasons for love, which one of the views says that there aren't. The the natural questioner, you might think, well, what is like the what? Why uh, are we motivated by love in that case? Then um, love seems to give us motivating reasons, um, and that seems to be a problem for that kind of view, which uh, wants to place the source of love in the subject or the lover. Mm -hmm. um, so, anyways, yeah, we'll we'll look at that soon, though. Yeah, I think there's one other thing to just frame the, the question is. When we talk about love, we can talk about parents loving their children, children loving their parents, you're loving your sisters, your family members, your friends. And the typical case we have in mind when we talk about love, it's uh, the romantic love. And uh, we're mainly going to talk about romantic love and it's the literature oh, that we're going we're gonna to see, we're going to try to understand. They, f they focus on this romantic love, if I understand correctly. Yeah, so... One of the things that uh, in approaching this uh, question, you see a lot of people um, trying to understand, well, what's the, the essential nature of love? That's kind of a crude way to put it. But so when they're asking this question, they first start with a romantic kind of understanding of love. And then they assume in, in some cases that they could build uh, from that understanding, you know, extrapolating other kinds of love. So like parental and, and um, you know, other kinds you mentioned, like familial uh, just purely f uh, friendship, those familiar with Aristotle um, know like the types of friendship that Aristotle thinks that we can have. Um, so anyways, you know, but there are some people who are skeptical about that move. Um, you know, they, they think that it's wrong to go that way. And they think that rather than building one account uh, of love from like, like a romantic first uh, kind of view, um, other people think that you should instead focus on different kinds of love as like their own genus or mm -hmm. not really comparable with one another at bottom. And I'm somewhat sympathetic to that move as well, but I, at least for the sake of this paper, I was just, uh, you know, interested in what the, you know, the essential nature of, of romantic love is as, a, as an emotion. And uh, maybe the last thing that I, I think it's important to set up is we're thinking in monogamic relationship. Uh, it could be between three and four people, and maybe that does not work for this, or maybe it works. So uh, we just take the classical example of romantic love between two people, and that's it. There's a few things to say about this. The first is just that when you read a lot of the literature on you know, an analytic philosophy of love, for wh whatever that label is worth, um, a lot of people approaching these kinds of questions will assume that love in its paradigmatic form, let's say, is something that happens only between two people in a, in a monogamous relationship. And if that's not stated, stated explicitly, you at least get that sense from the kinds of problems mm -hmm. that we're going to talk about uh, eventually. But the second thing to say is just that there's a ton of work being done on just focusing on different kinds of genuses of love. People have been saying, well, you know, polyamory or open relationships, it makes no sense to kind of push them out of our picture of love or, mm -hmm. or just our understanding and focus solely on monogamous relationships. And at least uh, we don't have to get too much into it uh, later on. Um, but I think that that's kind of like a, a virtue of my approach is that in the long run, it can, it's better at accommodating those kind of things. Mm -hmm. um, I just give, I'd like to give a shout out uh, to uh, Jonathan Jenkins, Ichikawa and uh, Carrie Jenkins at UBC because they, the two of them have really done a ton of uh, really great research in this uh, in this field of um, polyamory and open relationships um, and pushing back on the the assumption that we have to focus on you know love mm -hmm. from a purely monogamous uh, standpoint but yeah that all, that's all i'll say about that so i think we have the framing of the of the question and and now from wh what we discussed there are two polar perspective on the question of love the, there's the objective view and the subjective views and uh, in between them, there are a combination of these two views or something that is in the middle. And among others, is the relationship view that uh, you will uh, defend. So uh, first, may maybe let's start with a brief description of the two polar views uh, and then go more into details about the uh, objective views and then to continue the, a bit later with uh, the subjective view. Sure. So one thing that we can start off by saying is that uh, 
there's a ton of labels, uh, as is often the case with, you know, analytic philosophy that people like to throw labels at, at views and then call them different things. But um, you'll hear me call <laughs> this certain type of view um, a number of dif different things. But when you just hear it, you can think of the object centered or appraisal view of love. So this is also called the property view or the trait based view or the quality view of love. Um, this is like the quality view is what my advisor, Chris Howard, calls it. Any name is just like sort of uh, signaling the fact that the source of love is the beloved, the thing that is being loved. So essentially, when you take this view, you're saying that uh, the, the appraisal idea is that we are responding to uh, the exceptional value of our beloved's qualities. Um, and if we didn't value their uh, qualities, we wouldn't love them in some sense. Um, or at least we wouldn't have reasons to love them because mm -hmm. this is the object centered reasons uh, based view. So we can pull apart or just notice three kinds of claims uh, that this view will hold on to, or at least defend with some forthrightness. The first one is just that love is object centered. So as I said before, the basis of love is in some sense, uh, the valuable properties of your beloved and not you, the lover. Mm -hmm. uh, so the second claim adding to this is Love is reasons-based, so love is based in reasons, as I said before, and these are, in fact, the valuable properties of your beloved. So, if I love you, Kevin, <laughs> I will love you for your hair, your you know, your beautiful hair, and <laughs> your very nice eyes, and and so on. And I can give you a list. Um, I think the hair, uh, it's not gonna last for long, but the <laughs> eyes, it's I think it's a better <laughs> properties to like. And uh, so, anyways, the. What, what's going on here, and this is where appraisal comes in. So love involves an appraisal of value onto these properties. So uh, when I love you and, and call you my beloved, uh, I, I appraise value onto these uh, properties of yours. Um, so one thing that you like, one way you can think about this is just, and it's directly from the, the term itself, but appraisal of houses. Um, so, you know, you appraise different uh, houses at different values and whether you love or appraise a house or a person will depend on its value to you. Mm -hmm. Um, and if it has no, you know, value to you, then you won't love it or appraise mm -hmm. it as having value. Um, so that's just the basic idea. And the, this view is sort of traced back to Plato. So, um, Alan Sobel in one of his landmark books, uh, talks about how for Plato, when, you know, let's just talk in, in crude terms. So like when X loves Y, X is loving only in Plato thinks uh, the beautiful properties or things that Y possesses. Mm -hmm. So now that we have this sort of view, first view on the table, um, we can think about a number of problems that it might run into or just things that it might have difficulties uh, dealing with mm -hmm. if, if you if you want to. You made a, a great uh, description. So when somebody loves someone, the reasons is based on the quality of the person. So if the person don't have qualities for you then you cannot love them but if they have good qualities then you will mm -hmm. love them and there's something really intuitive people we at least think partially like that like love is at least partially the, because we don't love everyone and we always love people that have good qualities in general so it seems like quite intuitive and and why is it philosophical to think about that so i think with the the criticism that we we can address uh we we might see more uh what is the problem with this view Right. So one of the first problems, and we can identify at least three. And the first one just is the thought that, well, if you are saying that the reasons for love, which are, again, object centered, if they are just the properties of the person that you're loving, then it's a little bit perverted or crude to say, well, you know, there's there's really nothing beyond <laughs> the properties themselves that you're loving. There's mm -hmm. nothing behind Kevin, the properties that I'm loving. I'm not really loving you for who you are in mm -hmm. some sense, um, whatever, for whatever that means. So that's the first objection or thought is just that it doesn't really seem like a, a plausible view because the reasons for love are nothing more than just a list of properties that anybody could find valuable given, you know, the right context. Um, and so why think that love is some sort of special case? I mm -hmm. And I think we can see it when uh, one of the spouse, for, for example, uh, is really ill and cannot move and cannot talk and, and this the, the other spouse take care of the person and all the qualities are not there anymore so uh, should they not love them in this case and I, if intuitively we think that no you should still love your spouse even if he's disabled and cannot do anything mm -hmm. so even if he doesn't have his qualities then you should love the person still I, th I think it it's encapsulate a bit this this problem of the properties yeah and looking ahead like there, there there's another objection that uh, runs with that thought a little bit um but 
the next one that we can look at is just it's called the trading up problem in the literature but the the idea is just that you know if there were someone to come along and who had all of the same valuable properties that you loved in that person you would have to trade up so to speak um and if there's more a bit like especially yeah, if there's more yeah. a bit more if it's equal then yeah it's it's, it's hard a, to say it's maybe. a harder question if there's if yeah. it's equal but, but if it's a bit better then we should always try right. and and i think that's important here because that's the uh, the normative question should you trade for right. someone else right. and and i think here we we see it clearly and the thought is just for the the second objection is is um you know if if you're going to hold on to this object centered view well love just doesn't seem to be uh, fungible in this way mm -hmm. um, and and we'll look ahead you know like you mentioned there's some sort of endurance to love um you know wedding vows express that in some sense which mm -hmm. i'll talk about later but um like you were saying before if if your properties change in that kind of in some way which makes them less valuable to me then there's a way in which i'm almost in jeopardy of losing the love that i feel for you mm -hmm. <laughs> and that that seems kind of flimsy as a way of thinking about love um mm -hmm. but anyways so the the second uh, sort of problem that runs under this general objection is is called the doppelganger problem you were alluding to it before a little bit so here we can just think about a case like romeo and juliet so romeo loves juliet for her loyalty and confidence let's say um but somehow we're thinking putting on our philosophy caps here again um in a pure pure thought experiment but somehow an exact duplicate of juliet is is formed and this duplicate has exactly the same qualities of uh you know loyalty and confidence and much else besides that juliet has so romeo here has reason to love both of them and equally so mm -hmm. um or pick the clone over his original partner mm -hmm. um but again here the the fungibility of love it just seems to go against our intuitions because we seem to think that love isn't fungible in this way in mm -hmm. the sense that like if there actually were and again it's a, it's a kind of a wacky case where you have to imagine someone being cloned in in, a, in an exact way uh, with all the same properties but the thought is just meant to push against the intuition that love just is in some sense just reducible to the properties of the person that you're loving and it's meant to push against that thought and maybe to make a bit stronger the objective view we can ask ourselves does the history that i have with the person one of its properties so if you have a, a clone of of your lover but you don't have the history with the clone therefore uh, you should prefer the original person mm -hmm. so th I, th i think that makes the, the case stronger for objective view yeah and like i would say that you know i don't want to get too far ahead here but i think it actually not only makes a strong case for the objective view but it makes a strong case for combining the subjective and objective views which is mm -hmm. what i try and do but anyway so th that's that's just the idea is that um you know the doppelganger would have to in some sense be just as lovable mm -hmm. as your original partner and if we want to focus on the properties of of the person as being the source of love then it doesn't seem like a right way to go if we have these sort of cases you know wacky as they may be um so anyways that's just the second objection is that there's these kind of the doppelganger problems you know push in some ways they also sort of hinge on that um first objection that it seems perverted to just list a bunch of properties and say this is the reason that i love you and uh, the third criticism i think that we uh, we discussed was um like for example you love your children before they're born and therefore they don't they still don't have any properties yet mm -hmm. yes. so you love something uh, that has no properties so right. how can you love the properties right so I guess like another way of putting this third objection um including the one that you just mentioned again like a lot of these objections that we're discussing here for the objective centered view of love they can be kind of labeled under a, a general heading even though there's different types of problems but the one that you just men mentioned here is just the idea that the object centered reasons based view of love uh has difficulty accommodating a number of virtues that we you know at least commonly or ideally uh ascribe to love um so love seems to be unconditional and it seems to be enduring and it seems to be non-fungible as we talked about before um and none of these actually seem to come out of the object centered view and neither does the um you know parental love that you just mentioned mm -hmm. before where we don't even know you know the person's sorry the the child's properties yet who we who we are loving and you can imagine other cases as well where my advisor uh get, just to give you a quick story he get, he um told me a, a funny case that he wrote about once where you know he's interested in online dating and how 
this object centered view seems to be a, an odd case for online online dating because you're presented almost with a list of someone's properties. Mm -hmm. And so if they're valuable to you, then <laughs> you would seem to, you know, have all the, all these reasons just put in front of you to, to love mm -hmm. this, to love this person. But he tells this story about another professor fooling him on, on a dating app um, to think that it was a different, you know, to a different woman. But when in fact it was just someone else who was uh, another philosopher in the department mm -hmm. poking fun at him, um, <laughs> trying to get him to go on a date. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so <laughs> anyways, um, back to the objection. It's just that, you know, if we're going to focus on these lists of properties as the source of love, then these ideals or virtues that we usually think about in the context of love um, just aren't that attainable on this mm -hmm. view. So uh, especially like the, the ideal of unconditionality. So traditional wedding vows, like in sickness and in health, you know, from this day forward uh, until death do us part. Those kind of express the unconditionality and the enduringness of love. Um, but if you uh, uh, subscribe to this object sort of uh, centered view, then you have to say that love is in some sense an emotion that, you know, I'm just speaking third personally here, but like if I love, uh, you know, I will love you if you do this and are valuable to me, but I will also withdraw my love if you do Y and are not valuable to me. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be a little like, again, again, a flimsy mm -hmm. uh, picture of love. So back again to enduring, like, you know, from this day forward until death do us part, if you gain a few pounds or dye your hair a color that I hate, then my love might fade away, like mm -hmm. I was saying before. And that just seems to be, you know, not worth the name of, mm -hmm. of love. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that, that's the, the basic problem there um, is that the, the view just can't deal with these kind of ideals that are, you know, often so salient, especially in, like I said, wedding vows. And, mm -hmm. and you know, you can pull up a book of, of Shakespeare and they're in there as well. So uh, do you think we can go now to the subjective view sure. just to see like the other polar yeah, and to see maybe if they are better able to uh, answer those criticisms? Yeah. So again, there's been controversy, um, yeah, as is often the case with philosophy, a ton of controversy about which one is actually the, the better view. My current advisor, Chris, favors the view that we just talked about, the uh, objective uh, sort of reasons-based view and uh, you know that might be that might be of no surprise to you given the class that we had just had with him um, mm. and his stuff on fittingness and why he might you know be interested in this quality sort of view of love but now looking to this subject-centered view this is often called also the bestowal view of love so compared to the view that we just looked at this subject-centered view holds the opposite three claims uh, from the, the object-centered view so on the subject-centered view in the first place, love is subject-centered, obviously. So it just reverses the priority and says that love is based in the lover, not mm -hmm. the beloved. And we'll, you know, we'll talk about some reasons why it's natural to think that way. Um, the second claim is that love is, uh, or love involves bestowal of value. So love, the lover bestows value onto the beloved instead of the beloved having that value in the first mm -hmm. place and then them recognizing it. The final claim, the third one, is that uh, love is not reasons-based uh, or, you know, non-reasons-based, however you want to put it. Uh, so this is just, again, a reversal of the object-centered view. And the, cl the way to put the claim is just that love is not based in reasons derived from the valuable properties of your beloved. And mm -hmm. there's a number of uh, ways that you can interpret this claim, um, which is actually quite interesting. And we'll talk about that. But those are, those are the first three claims. Um, so just speaking broadly... You know, on this view, the lover, that's the first claim, bestows value, there's the second claim, onto their beloved, mm -hmm. there's the third claim. And this, you know, love is recognizing a value that's independent of an appraisal process in the beloved's objective value. So an appraisal of their properties as a person. So the contrast with the objective view couldn't be clearer, mm -hmm. as you can tell. And one of the reasons that that it invites people to either take one side in the debate or try and reconcile the two views. Mm -hmm. um, and so after talking about some of these objections, we'll look at one way that uh, someone named Dwayne Moore has tried to um, avoid some objections and go for the subjective view. Mm -hmm. And that's where I come in and, and respond to him with my relationship view. So now if you if you'd like to we can talk about some objections for this uh, subjective view unless you have any questions about the sub the, the three claims in yeah. contrast with the first but one but the subjective view is not that the person has some properties is that you you yourself give 
value to the other person. So even if the person is ugly, you think that the person is beautiful, therefore the person is beautiful. So it's not objective. Is yeah. it this distinction? Well, the this is, and again, this is why terminology is, you have to be careful here. And that's, we'll talk about, a little bit about that later because there can be different kinds of bestowal according mm -hmm. to Dwayne Moore. But just for now, we can think about Alan Sobel. He, I think, nicely compares it to bestowing hate upon someone in a similar way as this like non-reason-based, subject-centered view. So if you were to imagine bestowing hate upon someone that's not based at, in any way on their properties, it would be hating someone for no particular reason at all. Mm-hmm. If you were to ask, why do, you, why do I hate you? I have no idea. It has nothing to do with you, per se, mm -hmm. like your properties. And so Sobel says, well, you know, in this case, like, why in the case of love do we accept that, you know, if love is, you know, subject-centered and, and not based in reasons, you know, if we're just bestowing something that is not based in anyone's properties, then it seems pathological in some sense. And like, why would we the way he puts it is like why we would help someone get over hating someone for no particular reason but loving someone for no particular reason is just you know why do we cut the line there mm -hmm. um so anyways i think that's an, an interesting way of thinking about it um is that like if you think about the opposite emotion of like you know people often say that there's a thin line between love and hate mm -hmm. <laughs> anyways I, I you know i just like that phrase <laughs> Can, um, can you just give maybe a, an example of uh, somebody that the classical example of somebody having this subjective view? How would you explain uh, the love that they have for for someone? Maybe with a, a clear example. Right. So one of the uh, you mentioned a little bit earlier when we were talking about the objective view, you said, "Well, what if I love my child who isn't born yet, mm -hmm. um, and they don't have properties, but yeah. I still am loving something mm -hmm. in some sense, I guess." And that's exactly how um, his name's Harry Frankfurt. Um, he's got a quite a name for himself in other domains, but he wrote this uh, little witty book on love, and he pushes the you know the objective view, uh, or at least pushes against it um, in a similar way. And he says, well, he's very sympathetic to this idea, and he says, well, if there are no properties, then clearly this kind of if not proves, but it, it means that. And again, he's. I think it's just worth keeping in mind here that he's sort of crossing the boundaries between romantic and parental love mm -hmm. because obviously you're not going to love your child romantically. Um, but he, he's just using this as a case to say, well, the, the reasons, at least just focusing on where the reasons come from, if there are no properties to provide those reasons, then it seems that the love ob most just obviously comes from the person who is valuing the, the child who isn't even born yet. He kind of talks about some of the objections that we addressed earlier and says well this kind of if not solves at least helps explain the the fact that you know you don't you don't, you don't even know the properties or the properties of the of the thing that you're loving could change mm -hmm. um and yet your love still endures mm -hmm. um so you know your your child could do just about anything i would hope and you would still love them mm -hmm. <laughs> um so this kind of unconditionality again of love he's kind of pushing on that point to say well you know, again, in the case of a child, this just shows that there's no object-centered reasons for love. Mm -hmm. And this is the kind of view, someone who's holding those three claims that I mentioned earlier, um, Harry Frankfurt, he's defending this subject-centered view of love. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, you, you kind of answered the, the third criticism. So uh, maybe let's explore the, 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 the first one, the kind of, um, it's not really love uh, because you you don't love the person, but you, you love their properties. So I think the subjective view it looks like it can answer this this question yeah one thing i would say though is that instead of focusing on how each different view can answer problems to one another i think it's actually more instructive to think about how each view has problems of their own mm -hmm. um so you know we can talk about how each view can deal with uh, problems across the board differently but one thing that I think is interesting to think about before we move on to the relationship view of love mm -hmm. that I want to defend, there's three types of objections that you could sort of target at any subject-centered view. And what I'm going to do later on is basically just combine all of them into one that I talk about in terms of a specific dilemma. But anyway, so first, the first sort of objection that you could pose at this subject-centered view is called the relativism problem. So uh, subject-centered uh, love lends itself to value relativism in some sense. Mm -hmm. um, like we were talking about for, uh, with Frankfurt, 
uh, love originates in the subject and it's not based in the valuable properties of the, the beloved or the object that you're loving. So value is in some sense relative to how the, the lover is perceiving the beloved. Um, so people worry that the, the relativism is that that kind of charge would show that the subject centered view is in no better place than the object centered view mm -hmm. um, to defend its sort of priority as you know where love is coming from if it starts from the subject and not the, the qualities that the person have and you're on the love app it's like oh this person has not very much qualities I, it doesn't have much qualities oh i love this person this is not how we behave it looks something a bit counterintuitive like the more qualities a person have the, the more we tend to love them so it looks like there's something objective there yeah and like one thing one thing i'd like to return to actually now that you mention it um you had mentioned earlier like the relationship itself could be a reason mm -hmm. for love and one thing that i think is interesting to think about is like cases where it's the only reason for love or to, mm -hmm. the only reason to keep the love main, going yeah. <laughs> the main reason <laughs> love to, to keep love going right um and it's often you know the, the main theme or like a you know a main many uh, movies yeah many yeah. movies are, are based on that sort of yeah. <laughs> that premise that's uh one way of uh sort of we can think about that and, and introduce my view later but the the second sort of objection that uh you could pose at the subject centered view is just uh, talking about coincidences right so if love isn't based in these reasons that are object centered love seems to be arbitrary in some sense so you want to have some sort of like list like even if the love is not reducible to a list of properties, anyone who's been in a relationship has had the question posed to them, you know, why do you love me? And mm -hmm. there is like, you know, aside from joking aside about how there's no right answer to that, the thought is just that there's, if it's all coincidence, then the, the question of why do you love me? Like you could give any list of reasons, even if the value that you are, you know, loving in some sense or responding to when you're loving if the value isn't reducible to that list of properties the thought is just that well the lover would at least like you know appreciate some sort of list even mm -hmm. if it's like not forthcoming mm -hmm. <laughs> always so that that's that's one of the the ways of uh thinking about it and this is talked about often in, in terms of the motivation problem so especially just if you really really hold on to that non-reasons based view uh, or that claim uh for this view then you you think that no such list is ever forthcoming for those reasons that you that you love them. So again, you seem to fal uh, falter into value relativism. The problem of relativism. Yes. Yeah. Uh, what is the second problem? The second one would is just the coincidence problem. So, okay. um, like I said before, if love isn't based in reasons that are you know in the object, then you would expect more arbitrariness in, in love than than what you find. And um, there's there's some certain people that nobody loves, and there's people that everybody loves. So yeah, it and, looks and like there's something in the person. And it's just often the case that um, if you think about when you first begin to love someone as well, the thought kind of pops into your mind. Aside from just the fact that you love them, you think, well, wh why do I love them? You know, mm -hmm. what are, like the ins and and when you ask that question again, we're we're going back to you know putting all all of the science and empirical matter aside. When you ask that question, we're interested in how that's a normative question. Um, you know, why do I love them? What what reasons do I have to love them? And again, if if you think that no list of reasons is forthcoming, then that seems to be counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. um, and then again, just so your uh, the third objection is the motivation problem. Um, so if there are no uh, if there is no li list of reasons forthcoming, then what motivates you to mm -hmm. love uh, the love the beloved? And again, you follow that just sort of circles back into relativism mm -hmm. yeah, it looks like uh, the, the objective view is a bit too egoistic and the subjective view it's not enough egoistic so <laughs> you kind of find and want to find a line a of the fine line the middle ground yeah yeah yep. so yeah what is the relationship view sure so actually so one thing that we should talk about first is in setting up the relationship view in my thesis or my master's thesis i'm responding to what is what could be considered one of the the strongest or like you know if we want to steel man the subjective centered view as i mentioned before Dwayne moore he's tried to to defend this view and he he takes those three the three claims that we mentioned earlier and uh for the third one when we were talking about love uh, not being reasons based here he, he this is where he sort of adjusts this claim a little bit and says well there are no object-centered reasons for love, but there are subject-centered reasons for love. Mm -hmm. um, and this is why I think like you might like this view a little bit because it just says that, well, 
of course, the reasons that, that motivate us to love someone, they aren't, you know, the, the properties that, that we would put together in a list. They're actually our desires and preferences and motivations and, mm -hmm. and so on and how those fit together. So he says, uh, Moore says that the third claim leaves it open for you to accept that there's no object-centered reasons for love, but you can, you know, sort of add mm -hmm. into this view that there are subject-centered reasons for love, even mm -hmm. though you're still holding in some sense, a, no, a non-reasons-based view of love. Mm -hmm. You just have to be specific about your terminology. How do you respond to that? Do you, do you think that that's... Because uh, that, that sort of satisfies some of the worries, at least some of the worries about, like, especially where the properties aren't valuable to, mm -hmm. to you. If I understand correctly, what you said is the Steelman version of the subjective view is that there's something in me, for example, I want to look like I have a lot of prestige to other people. And therefore, when I choose my partner, I want a partner that makes me look like having more prestige. So it's not the like, and the prestige is through their, her beauty, for example, an easy case. So she is beautiful, but it's not just the fact that she is beautiful, it's the fact that I want this prestige and it's this relationship between her properties and the prestige that I searching for as a subject. Is, is it this kind of... Uh, way of seeing it kind of um like one the argument that Moore gives for taking on this way of thinking about the third claim he gives two arguments for them for this way of thinking about it and the first one is in the context of like the subject object, object conflict so if you think about like shrek and and fiona from the mm -hmm. movie shrek shrek is an ugly ogre and fiona is appraising him as you know being beautiful or handsome or mm -hmm. whatever and you know loving him and if love is based in object-centered reasons then Fiona shouldn't feel love. Um, and if love is based in motivating reasons, then it makes sense to think about, mm -hmm. you know, because it's centered in Fiona rather than Shrek's ugliness, mm -hmm. <laughs> let's say. Um, so that's the, the subject-object conflict uh, way of thinking about it is just that, you know, that pushes you towards thinking that love is based in, in subject-centered motivating reasons mm -hmm. rather than object-centered, uh, you know, property-based reasons. Mm -hmm. The second argument that he gives is the case of diverse attractions. So uh, often people respond differently to, you know, their prospective beloveds or their properties that they encounter in whatever context. So, and I think that this is quite, you know, depending on what side of the political spectrum you sit on, um, this is pretty common for any of us. But you can imagine a scenario where, okay, uh, Jane cherish cherishes conservative values and Julie, on the other hand, uh, cherishes progressive values. And here comes William. Uh, he's a conservative. And he enters a discussion with both of them. And if love is based in object-centered reasons, then they should both feel love towards him. Um, but love is based in motivating reasons because in, so in most cases, the person whose uh, values align with uh, Williams will be the one who loves him, uh, whereas the more progressive person will not. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that case of diverse attractions is just meant to, again, push you to think that instead of the reasons being object-centered, they're more uh, subject-centered in, the, in the lover's preferences and mm -hmm. uh, beliefs, desires, and so on. Mm -hmm. Those are two ways of thinking about it, or at least arguing for um, that way of, of holding the third claim. Mm -hmm. Good. But I think, uh, can, you, can you present a bit more the relationship view? Because I, I think you have this a bit in the relationship view, this capacity to accommodate this idea. Right. So the relationship view that I talk about it's it's kind of built out of Moore's uh, subject-centered view. So he talks about, again, I mentioned that there's, I'm going to have to trace back a little bit here to introduce my view, but you'll remember that I talked about bestowal. So Moore says that there's three types of bestowal. I'm not going to mention the first one, but there's moderate and weak types of bestowal. So if you moderately bestow someone, you're not bestowing new properties onto the person that you're loving, but you're only bestowing value onto your beloved's properties. And if you uh, weekly bestow someone, then you're bestowing uh, value onto the beloved's properties, a, a surplus of value. So Moore talks about this example of, and after this I can talk about my relationship view, but he gives us ex this example to think about different types of bestowal for a child who is painting two separate balls red. So one of the two balls was already red and the other one was blue. So in each case, we can say that the child is painting each ball red despite whatever color the original properties were mm -hmm. whether they were red or blue so if you think about love in a similar way 
if the ball was blue when you were painting it red, then that's a case of moderate bestowal, and weak bestowal is just when you were painting it over red. So you can think about in the same way with uh, loving someone's properties, mm -hmm. uh, how you would weakly versus moderately bestow them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like uh, Fiona, she's exactly. moderately. And, exactly, yes. And most of us are weakly yes. doing something. Yes, so having said that, um, this is the... Um, now, stepping back for a minute, um, we can... Like I said before, there's a question that I, you know, sort of introduce my view with, and I am sympathetic to uh, this way of thinking about it. But Alan Sobel talks about the subject and object centered views in terms of what he calls the Euthyphro dilemma. People, you know, familiar with Plato will think, aha, Euthyphro, <laughs> um, as in from, you know, Plato's dialogues. But essentially, this is just putting a twist on the divine command debate and saying, well, Let's put it in terms of love and ask if Marie values her beloved gangster enough to moderately bestow value on his toughness and ruthlessness because she loves him as a matter of like subjective, mm -hmm. subject-centered reasons. Um, and not because his the, the beloved's uh, toughness and ruthlessness are valuable as properties themselves, objectively. Then we can ask like, why does Marie love the gangster at all? So... Moore would say, well, this is a moderate bestowal of value, and you're bestowing value onto properties that are already disvaluable. Mm -hmm. um, so you're painting over the ball blue, as mm -hmm. it were. <laughs> so Alan Sobel asks the question, uh, he poses it in terms of the subject-centered, non-reasons-based view, and he says, um, so if, if I think that someone is beautiful or good because I love them, the natural question is to ask then, if I evaluate them as beautiful and good because I love them and not because they are beautiful and good, then why do I love them at all? Um, so this is, like I said before, putting a, a twist on the classic Euthyphro dilemma. So the, the other way that you could ask the question is, do I love someone because they are or I judge or perceive them to be beautiful or good? Or do I think that they're beautiful or good because I love them? Mm -hmm. So you can think about how well, the object-centered, reasons-based view would say, I love X because she is, or I judge or perceive them to be beautiful or good. Mm -hmm. And the second subject-centered view would say, well, no, I, I think X is beautiful or good because I love them. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the, t the question that I approach or use to approach my view and introduce it. So like I said before, Moore thinks that that love would be a moderate bestowal of, of disvaluable properties in some cases, um, especially when those uh, properties are, you know, things like just uh, uncontroversially disvaluable in any mm -hmm. uh, relationship. And my sort of gripe or, you know, the thing that I don't like about Moore's view is that his uh, bestowal view doesn't adequately explain uh, how cases where the beloved lacks these kind of valuable properties, but is being moderately bestowed value by the lover it's it's not some sort of arbitrary command by the lover's motivating reasons which in some case we might be you know su suspicious about in some ways like the you know people's beliefs and desires we have less not i don't want to say direct access to them but i hold my beliefs a little bit less with less credence than i do the, f the fact that i perceive you to have certain properties or to judge you to be um you know beautiful um and so on so that's the, the sort of thought. But with the relationship view that I introduce, this is sort of centered around the idea of an Aristophanic reason. So this is one of the last ideas that I'll sort of introduce for my view. But we've been talking a lot about reasons for love. And one, you know, reading this literature, one might think, well, do you have to only think about a reason for love in terms of like being object-centered or subject-centered? Mm -hmm. And this is where the third kind of view comes in. And they say, well, no, a reason for love can be relationship-centered. So the idea of an Aristophanic reason for love um, comes from Aristophanes' uh, speech in Plato's Symposium. And if for those who have read it, this is just the dialogue where Aristophanes is talking about human beings being double creatures cleft in half by Zeus and left uh, to wander to the earth looking for their, you know, their soul other mates, halves and, yeah. and their soulmate. Um, now, this is a, you know, it can be an evocative but sometimes misleading metaphor because, the, the, again, the idea is that we're sort of searching for our matching half as a human whole, but that's not quite what I want to, that's not quite the way that I want to defend an Aristophanic reason. As I understand it, an Aristophanic reason is just a reason for love that instead of focusing on 
specific properties of the beloved themselves. It focuses on properties of the relationship. So one one way of uh, first thinking about it might be you had mentioned earlier, like cases where the only reason for love is just the history, the, yeah. the history of the relationship itself, and just the fact that it's been going on for so long, and that is in some sense a, a not a property of the beloved or just like reducible to their properties mm -hmm. and it's a, a, a property of a a b a in conjunction with b <laughs> so <laughs> the nature of a's relationship with b so if we think about this idea of an aristophanic property i want to try and apply it to moore's example and if we think about marie who has her beloved gangster who is ruthless and and tough and all that i want to use this idea of an aristophanic reason for love to say well i disagree with more that love is in this case a moderate bestowal of a value in this case again thinking about the ball uh, the ball is blue and marie is painting it over red mm -hmm. i think that the disvaluable properties are going from being properties of just the the gangster to aristophanic properties of the relationship between marie and her beloved gangster mm -hmm. so I'm just going to read out a quote here from Robert Solomon. Uh, this is a paper I uh, use in my thesis quite a bit. So I follow him in this way of interpreting the al allegory, but uh, he says that it's an account of love as an emotion in which a person, and preferably both persons, come to understand his or her identity or their mutual identities with and through the other person. So again, we have to be careful here about how we use the metaphor. We're not uh, saying that it's some sort of like searching for your soulmate and that's when you truly find yourself and who you really are. The idea is just that the type of reasons that I call Aristophanic reasons that give rise to love in this kind of relationship sense, they have this kind of, you know, if you allow me the term, the sui genre uh, role of only existing in, in the context of your relationship with that person. So one way of thinking about this just in terms of examples uh, would be switching from like ruthlessness and toughness you know, if you think about vulgarness and like, you know, people's uh, people's habits of telling jokes mm -hmm. in one context, an aristophanic reason for love, you know, someone might love the fact that their partner tells very crude jokes uh, that are might be borderline racist or misogynistic or, or what have you. And so they might that might be an aristophanic reason for love in their uh, the context of their relationship. I'm, I'm willing to grant that. But my thought is just that in other contexts where that kind of reason for love isn't present. It, it would be, you know, a reason to feel, you know, perhaps indignation towards the ill will that they're showing women in general or, you know, minorities in their racist or misogynistic remarks. Mm -hmm. So that's that's just some examples that I that I talk about in my thesis to push against the intuition that there could be subject centered reasons for love without there being object centered reasons for love. Perhaps we can go back to um the those three claims that i talked about earlier so yeah. those those three claims for the subject centered and object centered reasons mm -hmm. instead of saying that uh you know instead of subject or object centered mm -hmm. uh love the relationship view would say that love is relationship centered and this is why i asked if you wanted me to sort of talk about how my view is different from other relationship views because you might say well relationship it's love is relationship centered in the sense that there's a we that, you mm -hmm. know, there's a, a second, like a, a person over and above mm -hmm. uh, or like some sort of amalgamation of us mm -hmm. that is the, that that's that we're loving um, mm -hmm. when we when we love someone. But that's not what I'm what I'm quite saying. OK, so that might be a little bit helpful for getting it uh, my view a little bit clearer. But so that's the that's the first sort of claim is that love is uh, relationship centered. And that's just relationship centered in the sense that love comes from the shared identity that you get from a relationship mm -hmm. um, the fact that when you enter a relationship with someone you no longer understand your properties in isolation from one another in some sense this is again keeping in mind the the difference between the we relationship view um you know there's people refer to to couples mm -hmm. <laughs> as like a you know a unit yeah. yeah as a unit in some ways uh -huh. <laughs> as as kind of crude as that might be but I'm sort of referring, I, I'm holding the this first claim in the weaker sense and just saying that it's more thinking about the history of the relationship and mm -hmm. the strong bonds that you get between the way that you view your properties. And like another uh, way of thinking about it is instead of parsing out bestowal and appraisal and saying that love is just one of them, mm -hmm. this, the relationship view could 
combine bestowal and appraisal and say that perhaps love is something that starts in appraisal and ends in bestowal. Oh, okay, that's interesting, yeah. Or it's some sort of, again, you know, you, you Because at the beginning, of course, there's yes. no relationship, so you love the properties yes. of the person. And, and then it's kind of a, a, mm -hmm. a progression towards bestowal. But mm -hmm. some people say, well, why, why, would you, why would you start in that order? Why don't you reverse the priority? And other people think that instead of, you know, progressing from one to another in a sort of linear path, it's more of like a, a circular, mm -hmm. you know, you know, you could draw on Hegelian dialectics and say that, like, you know, by combining the two, you some sort of you, you get some sort of, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> some sort of third one that's higher than uh, both of them. But anyways, leaving that aside, um, that's just the second claim in, t in contrast with the first two views that we talked about. The second claim would just say that instead of love either being bestowal or appraisal, the relationship view would be open to saying, well, it could be a combination of the two. It could be progressing from one to another. And again, this is just thinking about in terms of shared identity that we mm -hmm. just talked about. And the third claim, going back to speaking out about love in terms of reasons, here there's an interesting sort of move because, again, we were thinking about how you could interpret the non-reasons-based claim for the subject-centered view as saying, well, there's no object-centered uh, reasons for love, but there are subject-centered reasons for mm -hmm. love. But if you hold the relationship view, you seem to be open to, like, the the reasons for love that would be relationship-centered would kind of be open to, perhaps, you'd be able to say it could be based in the properties or the lover themselves. In some sense, it's a, a dynamic relationship between the two over evolving over time. Mm -hmm. So... That's a, another way that uh, the third claim can be kind of, you can accept the, the idea that there are motivating reasons for love that are based in the subject, but you could push back against the subject-centered view and say, well, these kind of, you know, the, the Aristophanic reasons that I talked about before, these are types of reasons that only arise in the context of our romantic relationships with one another. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's just how you would compare the three main claims uh, for these types of views. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I just do in my, in my thesis is, um, in my master's thesis is talk about how there's some precedence in, you know, if you look in other areas of like phenomenology and that kind of thing, there's a similar discussion about, you know, reconciling the subjective and the objective into this kind of blend of the two. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I was particularly influenced at the time by my uh, advisor, Gary Foster. Um, and so I was reading starts being in nothingness at the time and borrowed some quotations from him but the idea of shared identity is is still present there mm -hmm. so for example if you love your child before they're born then you start with the, the subjective view but then the child is born and then you like uh, her or his qualities so it, it, co it can go in this sense but if you meet a romantic partner generally you love the properties that you see and then the subjective view goes in so you can goes in in both direction yeah um, and like one one thing that i'd like um we could end or like at some point we could end thinking about uh my view like i defended my view actually against doing more in a colloquium talk at wilfred laurier and he posed a quite interesting question to me i think he had a, ch a chance to give some comments to me mm -hmm. after my you know respond to my presentation and after saying that I think that his view is susceptible to a euthyphro dilemma, he came right back to me and said, well, your view is susceptible to a euthyphro dilemma. Mm -hmm. And the way that he put it was, well, if we're going to ask about the fact that if you love someone because they're beautiful or good, or do you think that they're beautiful or good because you love them, we can pose the same question for the relationship view. Mm -hmm. um, do you love someone because you're in a, in a relationship with them, or are you, are you in a relationship with them because you love them? Mm -hmm. Oh, so yeah, um, it, it makes a different <laughs> problem. Yeah. Yes, so the sort of like, just some food for thought is like, for all the precedent that I'm trying to, you know, use to defend my view in this kind of like, you know, showing that there's these, there's a big competition between these two sides and I'm trying to take a, a sort of neutral position. Um, someone might, you know, from that perspective say, well, you're just as vulnerable to the same kind of problems that we are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I think that's a, an interesting move. I will admit that I haven't uh, given my, you know, trajectory of my PhD studies and everything. I haven't given too much thought to that objection to my mm -hmm. view, but I... At the end of the day, I think I can handle it a little, a little bit better than the subjective view. Yeah, it, it's really interesting. The Are you in a relationship because you love them? 
so uh, th- th- you love them and then you become in relationship but your view like because you're in relationship you start to love them but when we stop to love them mm-hmm. but you're still in a relationship how, how do you accommodate that yeah one thing i like i think it's an interesting way of of first approaching this view that i'm interested in defending because aside from this this problem there's other Uh, worries that you might have about just like Robert Solomon calls the downright perverse reasons for love that you might have you know these are just based on like pure sexual preferences or you know just whatever like anything can just about be a reason for love so you have to think about accommodating all these different kinds of of reasons so I think that at least when you're approaching this question and saying well do I love someone because I'm in, in a relationship with them or am I in a relationship with them because I love them I think I want to take the the first answer Um, but again, like it, it poses further questions about like, well, the, the terminology here is, is just, you know, I, I hate that it's kind of clunky sometimes and hard to follow, but could there be like a subjective and and objective view within the relationship view itself? If we're asking Mm -hmm. this kind of use of rote question for this view, but again, I think it's, um, it's not quite, it's not quite settled yet. (laughs) Yeah. But uh, yeah, it would have been really weird if you would have settled the question of love. (laughs) Um, but the thing is that we have a clear, um, I, and I think that's the most important part is, oh, we can love the properties of the person or it can be what you, you have, like from in your eyes, you you love them because of something inside of you that uh, searching for something. And then you can love the we that we become or you can love the uh, historical part of our relationship. And all those four answers are right and sometimes uh, i feel like in some examples of my friends or me sometimes it was more one view can explain it better the second view can explain it better the third and the fourth and it depends on on the situation so yeah maybe a view that can accommodate those four ones would be the best one or maybe you can say all four views have their strength and we just change from one view to the other depending on the situation and the kind of love and and because we said it like our talk was more about the romantic love Mm -hmm. but then there's so many other different types of relationship but there's many different ways that when you're in a relationship with someone in a a romantic sense that the the specific characteristic of your relationship make it more likely to be the first the second or the third or the fourth views that uh, that might be more most helpful to help you to understand it yeah i would say like i'm inclined to think that in some ways, like the the relationship might itself be like the primal Aristophanic reason, and then you kind of have like this um, b- this branching tree of of a bunch of other Aristophanic reasons as the relationship develops. Mm-hmm. But you're right to point out that there's it's often a battle of of, of intuitions in philosophy mm-hmm. and and getting people to think in favor of one view over another purely based on intuitions because we're putting on our, our kind of philosophical caps and, mm-hmm. and asking this question from a pure, purely normative stance. Um, but I, I just think that even if we are trying to ask the question from that perspective, it's still valuable to think, well, what are we gaining from <laughs> thinking about this problem in this way? Like one, one way I like to think about it is, is a, a parallel debate in moral psychology with narrative you find a similar polar opposite debate, although not completely the same. Um, but you get people who are enthusiasts about narrative and they'll say like, you know, our moral psychology and the way that we understand ourselves is like narrative at bottom. Um, we understand ourselves in terms of like narrative structure of our lives. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's the skeptics who will say, you know, I completely disagree and I have no sense of myself as like being within and like, you know, experiencing a, mm-hmm flowing and unfolding narrative and you have people that will try and find a middle ground between those Mm -hmm. views and pull the intuitions and again the point is just that it's a game of intuitions in philosophy sometimes so you're just trying to defend your view in a way that it's least like it's least susceptible to as many objections as possible and that's all that i'm trying to do views come in and out of vogue quite often especially when you look back at the history of philosophy you know I, i myself don't do history of philosophy i'm more on the analytic side Although I think that that's, you know, that's a whole other topic that we could talk about on a different podcast, maybe. But, you know, like analytic philosophers just aren't interested in the history of philosophy Mm -hmm. too often. But, you know, you do often find this kind of views coming in and out of vogue and people trying to find middle ground between them and going back to the The first one, the the first the first uh, debate that they originally were (laughs) were caught up on. And that just, you know, I think it just brings, uh, you know, as as frustrated as you might get with that. 
I think it also kind of shows the virtue of philosophy. Whether you think that we're making some sort of progress or not, I still enjoy the process <laughs> quite a bit. I think it's a good way to finish. Like we, we, we don't get an answer on love and uh, it was fun. So uh, yeah, thank you. let's end it there. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thanks.